All right, so we've we've looked at the asset classes. We've understood our our investor appetites and who we are as investors. Now, how, how do I go about selecting where I'm going to deploy my capital? Now we always see the hashtag DYOR on Twitter and we always wonder where we begin. So I'm going to show you where I begin as a baseline and then I build from there. So how to go about investing. On the left your side here of the screen, you'll see that this is the graph of the South African economy. And this is why I say it's not a pleasant picture because since 2008, when we had the GFC, Great Financial Crash, our economy still hasn't recovered. Here's the crash that we had from the G GFC and our economy, our GDP, our gross domestic product. So the things we produce has been getting less, which means South Africa is actually a net importer. That's why our currency actually devalues over time because we're probably importing more than we're exporting and many other factors. So the GDP has been trending downwards for the last 12, 13 years. Then we had COVID and you might read a story, economy recovers 30%, but guys, we're starting at a very low baseline. So although it's gone up 30%, we're still below 2008 levels. Unemployment is going up, all right? Taxes, the income the state is getting is going down because we're losing jobs. Now we still have a central bank that's considering increasing interest rates because they believe in austerity. They're trying to control inflation. So what they're doing, they're doing something wrong there. There needs to be a, a big change up to get the economy running hot. And to get it running hot, we need inflation. We need growth. We need productivity. We need people to spend. So that's the first thing I look at is the economy I'm investing in. Now, this data is from Stats Essay. You can go there and use it to gather the information you need. There's something I want to point out here. Average annual household expenditure is 71000 a year, which works out to be about 6000 a month. So I'm not sure what how many people are in a household, maybe three or four, but the average household expenditure is 6,000. Now think about this, guys, yourself. When you are in financial distress or you, you, what are the things you are going to spend money on first? It's going to be the essentials. You're going to cut out everything you need. So let's think of some essentials. You need food, you need housing, you need transport. And possibly education is one of the last things you'll, you'll, you'll maybe cut. I've always said recession, education is recession proof. That's why I became a teacher. But let's, let's take the 6,000 that a household has and place you yourself in the economy that's not growing. Now, where is the money flowing? I need to follow that money. Now, let's focus on transport. We know we need transport to get to work or to move around, either in taxis, trains, buses, or our own cars. So first of all, I start there. Now, I must thank uh, Madima, Ma Ma Mano Madima from Twitter. When I saw this post and I was investing the statistics and I heard about transaction capital, this is how I started connecting some dots. Okay, so it fits in the narrative of how much people are spending and transport is a household expenditure that people need to spend money on. So this where there's money flowing. I'm not going to go buy Fashini Group now when people need to buy transport, but they can still wear the same T-shirt for the next two years. So is it transactional capital or Fashini Group? Take Fashini Group off, I'm on transaction capital. Transport. So when I saw his tweets, I thought, okay, that's brilliant. Let me dig deeper and see how I can relate it to my own research. Then we have some information that's from his tweet too. You can go to his profile just to see the tweet is a bit longer. Medima at Maino Medima up top here. If you want to check out the post. He does share insightful information. So guys, Twitter is an awesome place to gather the information you need.
but don't rely 100% on what people are telling you. Vet, vet that information, write it down, try and make sense of it, do your research, and then confirm it. Otherwise, you might follow someone else's conviction and they've done it wrong, and you end up thinking, why? So I'm not going to get into the details of the company, but there's a few things that I want to point out. So bus transport down, rail transport down, 64%. More people are using mini taxi buses now than ever before. That's up 16%. There's up to 15 million people each day needing to use taxis to get to work, get to shopping centers, get to schools. Now I need to follow the money. This company is in a money hotspot, so it's on my watch list now. Now remember there's price and value. The price is what I pay, the value is what I get. I could be buying the company now at an exorbitant fee when it's overvalued, so I need to watch it. I understand the fundamentals, I put it on my watch list, and then, oh, sorry, and then I use technical analysis for my entry point, and then I follow a strategy of cost dollar averaging in to buy the dips of a company that I know is doing well. Now, here's an important thing to look at. If the repo rate goes down, that makes financing costs cheaper, right? So wouldn't that affect a company that's using credit to raise capital or to generate income? But look at the interest rate they are charging taxi operators between 12.5% and 26%, which is absolutely crazy. Because if you remember what I said earlier, when costs go up, what do business owners do? They transfer that onto the consumer. So if interest rates are high and I'm a taxi operator and I've got debt to pay and I've got a 26% interest on my finance, on my loan, I'm going to push the price of taxi fares up to cover the cost plus to make myself some. So if I'm a taxi, I catch taxis, I'm going to invest in the share possibly at the right price so that I can get a rebate for my expenditure. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes I invest in companies that I use. So I use the example of PayPal on my Twitter feed a few, few days ago. I earn income in PayPal, but someone might pay me $10, but I only get $8 because of the fees, the conversion rates, and to get the money out. Now I'm losing $2, but PayPal is gaining $2. Now, if PayPal paid dividends, I would get dividends, which is acting as a rebate. So although I'm paying the $2 fee, I'm getting cash back to me. So my, my $2 fee might actually only be 50 cents. So it could be wise to invest in a company like this to offset your expenditure. So I'm spending a hundred bucks on taxi every day, which is exorbitant, I know. But if the company pays dividends, in the long run, I'm getting rebated for that because I'm a shareholder. But it also shows you again, there's the, the interest rates and the way business and economy is set up, it's not to benefit us, the consumers. We are cogs in a machine that generate money for, let's call them the elite. So I've got a company from my research I've got on my watch list. Now I can continue doing my research still on stats essay, which is also another very scary stat, which is in line with the GDP going down. From January 220, from 2020 January, Okay, these numbers are in thousands, so this is actually 16 million, guys. At the beginning of January 2020, we only had 16 people employed in South Africa. Now, that's 16 million taxpayers. By January, first quarter of 2021, we now have 14,995,000 employed. That's a 1.3 million Let's round it up and say 1.4 million decrease in the labor force. Now, how does your economy grow if you are shedding jobs? Again, it comes down to what's happening, austerity. We aren't running our economy hot. 
we need inflation so we can increase productivity, so we can increase employment, so we can increase the goods that our GDP is producing. But that's not happening. So why am I going to be 100% concentrated in an economy that's now got 14, 15 million people employed? That means less income for government tax revenue collection. So they have to increase taxes, put more pressure on the working class, which stuns the velocity of money. And you have this, that graph that I showed you. That's why it plays out like that. Okay, thanks for joining, guys. If you can mute your microphone for me, I'd appreciate that. So follow the money. Which provinces now have the most employment? We can see Western Cape, there's 2.5 million people employed. Eastern Cape, 1.3 million, and so forth. You can see which economy or which provinces shed the most jobs in that time. Gauteng lost 4.6 million jobs, guys. Sorry, 56,000 jobs. They went from 5 million to 4.6 million. So why? I don't know. Maybe people are moving to the coasts. Maybe we're working from home so they don't want to stay in that section. Maybe crime is high. You have to dig deeper. You're going to follow the money. You're going to follow what businesses plan to set up. I, I'm definitely not going to go and move to Northern Cape because maybe there's not many jobs there. So you can position yourself, mobility, in an economy within the economy where the money is flowing, in the region that people are spending money. So although the economy is doing bad, not good, you can still benefit from where money flows. Now we'll look at the sectors that shed the jobs and which sectors actually gain jobs. So again, we went from 16 million to 14 million. Every sector basically lost money except for manufacturing, utilities. Finance was the biggest contributor to employment. It was the only sector to add jobs from January 2020 to January 2021. If you look at this, this column here, you'll see that every sector shed jobs except for finance. From finance shed jobs during COVID, probably during lockdown, but gained all those jobs back plus some by quarter one, 2021. No other industry in South Africa did that. Now, it's good, but we need manufacturing, guys. We don't want to be a service-based economy. We want to produce. So the highest loss was construction, 87,000 jobs. Now, I'm not going to go buy a construction share because they're shedding jobs. There's no capital expenditure. There's no infrastructure. The state is earning less income. If social grants go up, for example, or subsidies, they need to divert capital expenditure from functioning sectors to support the economy. So construction, there might not be any infrastructure expenditure, trade. This could be potentially why the RAND has strengthened too because we aren't importing as much. So our surplus is going up relative to what we're importing. So that's giving the RAND short-term strength. And private households, that's like um, domestic workers, gardeners, maybe chefs, but, uh, valet drivers, so you can see there's a lot of pressure in the household market because what, what are you going to do when you're under pressure? You're going to cut your non-core expenses first. Now, if I want to invest, I'm going to look at the areas that are growing jobs, finance. Now, most of us are probably thinking Purple Group. Now, tomorrow I have a post coming out about innovation, digital currency, uh, disruptions of incumbents. Ah, it's very good. It's going to be intriguing. And it, it plays into the narrative of finance, how the economy is changing and where you want to put your money. Now, if we're really going to change our economy and we need to add jobs, that's basically 
So Nele, yeah, you have a question, you can unmute yourself, no problem. Okay, um, so, all right, sorry. So I wanted um, to ask you to just repeat what you said regarding why uh, the rent is, is currently strengthening oh, in okay. terms of, um, you know, us uh, being, um, you know, only be able to um, import, you know, you know, very few goods. How does that play around? I, I think I missed that. Okay, Can I'll explain just, it. So it. I'm, I'm yeah. just, I'm just making an assumption now. So I, I'm speculating, but it could be mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the rand is strengthening. So it could be two mm -hmm. reasons, in fact, multiple reasons. Dollar could be getting weaker. So just mm -hmm. because the dollar is weakening, the rand might just naturally strengthen. So South Africa is a net importer. So we buy more things from overseas than what we export. So when, when, you, when you hear about a deficit, when government doesn't have enough money, we must borrow money, that's because we have a deficit. So we're exporting more than we're importing. So if we mm -hmm. start importing less, that means we're exporting more. So our currency is more in demand because people are buying our products. So we get in more rands. So that will strengthen mm -hmm. the rand. If we send in rands out because we're importing, that makes that makes the the rand weaker. So okay. do you do you understand that, or do you, do I need to try and explain it better? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's it's a bit of, it's a complicated <laughs> no, one. I will digest it further. <laughs> and, yeah. I will I will make the video <laughs> this video recording available after after next week after this Sunday after I've done the last seminar. But yeah, me, it makes me, things worse because I'm not in the financial sector. Yeah. Okay. Let me just try and explain it quicker. So if, if the rand is at 14 to the dollar, right? And, mm -hmm. and a piece of corn costs me $1. It's going to cost me 14 rand. Now, if the dollar weakens and the rand strengthens, now I, I can buy $1, but it's going to cost me 13 rand. So I'm saving one rand. So I'm... I'm, I'm able to buy things cheaper because I have a stronger rand. Now the rand gets stronger because I'm buying less things from overseas. So I'm, I'm importing less and I'm producing more locally. Okay. So that, that's an important thing. Because of COVID, we disrupted supply chains. So things shut down. We are importing less, so our rand is probably strengthening because we haven't got a current deficit at the moment. Until that changes, yeah. So also while I'm doing research, it's not always about investing, guys. You're looking at, it's up, it's up to us South Africans to make our economy work, look to hire people, start jobs, start initiatives. So I look at finding constants and we always hear the joke, uh, taxes and death. Okay. But let's take a serious note here. Death is a constant. We are always dying. And in fact, 454,000 people, these are 2008 numbers guys. So it give or take could be higher, could be lower. I couldn't source the latest figure stats if they hadn't released it or I just didn't find it. So 454,000 amount of deaths South Africa has experienced in each year. So that's a constant. So look at companies that are offering services, insurance companies. Maybe you start a small business. You decide to sell coffins. You know you've got income coming in if you can market your idea, if people buy it. The market might be saturated, so you might take a risk and try it. You might fail and think, no, it's not for me. But let's look at how identifying problems Natural causes of death. So now these are ways people died other than heart attacks, natural ways of death. Maybe car accidents, suicides, murder. So now there's a problem, guys. If 54,000 people are dying unnatural deaths, it's either because the crime rate's high, South Africans like to drink and drive, for example, maybe, or they, we have a high rate of depression. So now, I want to solve a problem. I want to minimize that number. So I'm, I'm seeing a market now. What can I do? Maybe the tires on cars 
aren't of quality and that's why people are crashing. So now maybe I can source rubber from a country like Thailand, find a connection, bring rubber in, produce tires, grow a business. So look for problems in the data. Trial and error, guys. I'm not saying go and take 100K and throw it all in buying tires because that might not be the specific problem. So identify problems and then look for solutions to solve them because it's up to us at the end of the day to grow the economy. Another scary statistic is number of elderly who have health insurance cover. 20%. 20% of the elderly only have insurance cover. What's happening to the other 80%? They might be reliant on hospitals by the state. Okay. Also a business opportunity there. Maybe you can offer something like a service for when a family member dies, transporting the funeral home, taking care of catering, whatever it may be. So look at the data to find a problem and to find a business opportunity. And then also an important thing to remember, just to tie it all in together, when I'm doing my research, there's three things that can influence inflation sorry, increasing the interest rates. It's oil prices. So when you see oil prices going up, you should be singing, you should be hearing alarm bells. Now it doesn't automatically mean oil prices are going to cause inflation, but it's called second round effects. It's if those businesses transfer the costs onto the consumers. And this is what the governor of the Reserve Bank looks for. He looks for second round effects. He doesn't care if the oil price is going up or what's, what's, what's happening there. He's looking for second round effects. Transport costs going up, food inflation, everything down the supply chain increasing because businesses are passing the costs down the line. So that will warrant an increase in interest rates. Okay, Electrical prices, electricity prices will also increase and food inflation. So it's also all dependent on the price of oil and if those costs are passed down. So know your research, know the economy, understand the companies, look for the opportunity. And then asset allocation, how I go about it, you can look at, on. I don't know if you guys invest with easy equities, but they have easy research. So you can look at ETFs, what indexes they are invested in, And then look how they allocate, look at the top funds, the ones that have returned the biggest returns over the last year or two, and look at the funds that they are invested in, how they allocate their assets. Now you could replicate this in your personal name and save yourself the tier fees fees in the process, but then you're managing your own portfolio. You can see they have exposure, 50% equity, Probably because they've identified some of the stuff we have spoken about, high risk of not having that offshore exposure because of the the RAND devaluation. Offshore equity exposure, 19%, and just a combination of different percentages in different asset classes. So this, I believe, is, I think it was Sunlam Momentum, one of the top performing funds. Don't quote me on that. But they have to invest, I think it's, up to 75% in local assets. So that's why there's a high SA exposure here because this is a fund that's overseeing retirement funds where it's mandated that they must invest 75% in SA. 